Recording in progress. Goedemorgen iedereen. Uh, ik switch nu naar Engels, want alles zal in het Engels gebeuren vandaag. Uh, even dat u eraan bent. Good morning everybody here in the audience and everybody uh, following us on livestream. I uh, start this discussion this by opening the meeting, this academic session in which Anna Willers will defend her academic thesis in public. The thesis is written in English under the title Bleeding Related Conditions in Com and Complications in Extracorporeal Life Support. Before she, we start our opposition and the candidate her defense, the last one will, the mentioned, last mentioned Anna Willers, will start with a small presentation in which she presents us her research and the most important findings and conclusions. I ask you to start this discussion now and wish you all success and inspiration during the coming hour. Thank you very much, your highly esteemed pro-rector. Um, I'm going to explain to you um, what kind of research I've did in the past few years. And uh, I will start, oh, sorry. I will start with an introduction about the basics of extracorporeal life support. Then I will talk about the bleeding complications and the prediction of the bleeding complications. And at the end, I will talk about high-risk patients, such as trauma patients, uh, in extracorporeal life support. In the Netherlands, in 2021, more than 10,000 people died because of respiratory diseases. And in that same year, almost 20,000 people died because of COVID, and 6,400 people died because of influenza. In cardiac failure, in the Netherlands, each day, 25 patients that die under the age of 75 because of cardiac failure, and 95 patients die e each day because of cardiac arrest. Usually, these patients are supported with medications, um, oxygen supply, uh, invasive ventilation, and in cardiac uh, failure, sometimes uh, percutaneously coronary uh, interventions or even surgery. But what if conventional treatment is not enough. Then the extracorporeal light support can be of hand. And we also call it extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And from now on from this presentation, we will call it ECLS as an abbreviation. It serves as an artificial heart-lung machine and uh, it can provide cardiocirculatory and lung function support. Um, you can use it for several days to even weeks but it's important to understand that this is not a treatment, but it's, it's, it's a support system which can uh, serve as a bridge to further recovery, treatment, or even transplantation. The extracorporeal life support system drains low oxygenated blood from the body. It pumps it through a membrane which oxygenates the blood and the high oxygenated blood is then returned back to the body into the venous or the arterial system. When you pump it back into the venous system, it is called venovenous ECLS, and this can serve as a, a pulmonary support. If you pump it back into the arterial system, it is called venoarterial ECLS, and it serves as a um, support also for cardiac function, maintaining adequate circulation. The problem with using the ECLS is um, the exposure 
to the artificial surfaces of the system. Mm -hmm. And it uh, causes an interaction with the blood um, to prevent blood interaction and the forming of clots, we administer anticoagulation, but that has its adverse effects as well, such as bleeding complications. When you insert a cannula from the system, the blood reacts, and you can see here um, the immune system is activated, but also the coagulation system is activated. And we found that there are several coatings for the system to prevent this interaction. You have bioactive coatings, which include anticoagulation, such as heparin, and the aim is to prevent or at least diminish the reaction of the coagulation system. If you use biopassive coatings, you try to diminish or at least delay the inflammatory reaction of the body. As previously mentioned, we also administer anticoagulation and this is a figure of the complex uh, cascade of the coagulation system. And there are different types of anticoagulation that we can use. And as you can see, the different kinds of anticoagulation drugs act on different uh, parts of the system. Heparin, bivaliridin, and argatroban are the uh, drugs that are most often used. And lepiridin, rivaroxaban, and low molecular weight are not often used because they are still under investigation. Each of these agents have their specific disadvantages and advantages. We then looked at um, the management of patients that were put on ECLS while having bleeding complications or while having bleeding conditions. And we found in literature 181 patients that were put on ECLS while having bleeding. And most of them were put on venovenous ECLS. We found that our, there were different types of bleeding, um, such as intracranial bleeding, pulmonary hemorrhage, and also patients that were put on ECMO uh, after trauma and still had bleeding sites because of the trauma. We specifically looked at the methods that they used to uh, stop the bleeding or at least uh, prevent further exsanguination. Um, however, unfortunately, all these cases most of them did not specify the anticoagulation agent. But if we look at the agents that were mentioned, we see that heparin is most often used and also a heparin-free period. Um, if we look at the patients that developed further bleeding complications, we see that the heparin-free period is most often used after the, the cases that did not mention their anticoagulation management. And in the trombi uh, complications, we see that the heparin-free period is most often mentioned, which could indicate that a heparin-free period could cause risk to form clottings during support. Additive methods that were mentioned in these cases were damage control surgery, coiling or clipping of the bleeding site, administration of clotting factors, striving to lower targets of anticoagulation, and especially in uh, pulmonary bleeding, the bronchus was blocked or tube clamping was more mentioned. It is difficult to understand the trends of bleeding complications because the um, definition of bleeding complication dif differs between all the studies. Um, but we used a, a data set of patients worldwide and we looked at the trends of these bleeding complications in the past 20 years. With this figure, it is really um, astonishing how much the use of ECLS has been increasing. And if we look at the past 20 years, how often bleeding complications were mentioned, in veno venous ECLS, 22 patients developed bleeding complications, and in veno arterial ECLS, 30% developed bleeding complications. We found that bleeding complications were associated with higher mortality, but if we look at the trends, in venovenous ECLS, we see that the bleeding complications are decreasing, but mortality is not. And the same counts for our venoarterial ECLS. Again, we see a significant decrease in bleeding complications, but no significant decrease in mortality. If we look at the different types of bleeding complications, the decrease is most often seen in cannulation site bleeding and surgical site bleeding. 
And for instance, in gastrointestinal bleeding and in central nervous system bleeding, we do not see any significant changes. Since it's difficult to manage patients with bleeding complications, we try to uh, make a prediction model and uh, we decided to separate the venovenous ECLS patients with the venoarterial ECLS patients. And we used data from the last 10 years, including in venovenous, almost 20,000 patients. And with this table, I want, just want to show you that we used all possible potentially be predictors. And with a multivariable logistic regression analysis with backward wild stepwise elimination, we eliminated the least significant predictors. And we ended up with a prediction model with almost 25 uh, variables. And if we look at the area under the curve, it's 0 0.633, which means that the prediction value of this model is not great. But if we look at internal va validation of this model, the optimism of the area under the curve was very low, which means that this model would uh, work in the same way if we use it on an external cohort. We repeated the same techniques for veno arterial um, ECLS prediction model. Here we almost used 30,000 patients um, and we looked at extracorporeal pulmonary resuscitation if we should use it as a different model, but it turned out that the uh, regression coefficients were, were comparable to the uh, non-resuscitation VA, uh, veno arterial ECLS, so we used it as a risk factor. And again, we came up with a model also around 25 variables. The area under the curve was 0 0.660, which is a little bit better than the veno venous model. However, it's still not great to predict the bleeding complications. Also here, the optimism of the area under the curve is very low, which means this model would act or work in the same way if we would use it on an external cohort. We then looked at the high-risk patients, um, and those are trauma patients, because we know that trauma patients are at high risk for bleeding complications due to coagulopathy and uh, with diminishing circulation. Lactate acidosis can uh, occur with metabolic acidosis, which can further uh, decrease the myocardial performance, leading to hypothermia, and again, hypothermia can lead to coagulopathy, and this could further lead to exsanguination. And we believe that the ECLS could help in these patients. It could offload the venous system, it can maintain circulation, and you can resuscitate with this, with the ECLS better. Um, with maintaining the circulation, you could uh, clear the lactate, and especially with the ECLS, you could rewarm the patient better, and the temperature control could be very precise. We found out in the literature that there were a lot of different underlying um, diseases or uh, uh, injuries that uh, the ECLS could be of help, including inhalation injury, airway obstruction or tracheal rupture. When intubation is not possible and tracheotomy is not possible, you could use the ECLS for respiratory support. And also with blast trauma, contusion of the cordis or the lung, you could use the ECLS. And again, which I mentioned before, with hypothermia, but also in drowning patients. We also looked at uh, a data set. Uh, also worldwide patients were samengevoegd. Uh, uh, and um, we looked at the different types of complication. And we saw that cardiovascular complications were more often mentioned and renal complications were more often mentioned than bleeding complications. Um, but the bleeding complications remained around 30%. And in the underlying uh, figure, you can see that um, the interest of ECLS and trauma patients combined are increasing because these are the uh, publications that were published in the last uh, 10, 20 years. If we look at the trends of these patients, we see that the overall complications seem to decrease and the survival of ECL from ECLS and also the hospital survival seem to increase in the last few years. In conclusion, 
we, we see that bleeding complications on ECLS are decreasing. We know that coatings uh, and anticoagulation management are improving. The prediction of bleeding complications is still challenging, but high-risk patients can also benefit from ECLS support and should not be considered uh, as a contraindication anymore. And maybe future perspective could include the use of ECLS on site. I would like to give the word back to the project. Thank you. Clear presentation, exactly within the time limits, so that leaves time enough for a good discussion. Yeah. You agree? <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's nice. The discussion will start by Professor Buchen. He's Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the University Clinic in uh, Düsseldorf. He was a member of the Manuscript Assessment Committee. Professor Buchen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willis. It was a great presentation. I enjoyed it. I uh, would like to start directly with your conclusion slide. Um, you described very well that uh, the bleeding complications incidence is decreasing over the years. And nevertheless, the mortality is not decreasing. It's the same over the years. Um, what, what is your explanation for that? Is it only the sicker patients or do we have another problem that we don't see? Thank you for your uh, question and also for your compliments, your highly esteemed opponent. Um, yeah, so indeed, uh, bleeding complications are decreasing, and I believe it's because our ECLS system is improving. We have shorter circuits, we have better coatings, we have better understanding about the management of anticoagulation and also uh, um, the targeting that we should use. However, I don't think the bleeding complications are one-on-one -on -one connected with the mortality. We do have more use of ECLS, which could mean that we uh, perform ECLS uh, on patients that were really sick that we previously did not uh, uh, administer the ECLS for. Um, also, not only the underlying mechanisms or the diseases of the patient could, in, uh, could uh, uh, prevent mortality from decreasing, but there are more complications. It's not only bleeding. I mean, one third of the patients develop bleeding complications, but as we saw before, um, renal complications are uh, also often mentioned, and we have patients that develop infections or develop thrombotic complications. It's less, mm. but if those other types of complications are not decreasing as well, it might, uh, uh, yeah, it might influence the mortality. Um, then let's talk about the bleeding complications. Um, uh, your slide with the, with the four blue bars uh, about coagulation, no coagulation, reduced coagulation, anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. um, you say that the majority of patients um, suffered from complications that were without anticoagulation, mm -hmm. thrombi and something like that. Yeah. We in yeah. our center, we, we are more afraid of bleeding complications. So yeah. in the early period of ECLS, doesn't matter, post-cardiotomy or post-traumatic, we normally try to avoid any heparin or agatroban. We, mm -hmm. we use it without. Yeah. We try to, to, to have a flow of five or six liters and then we don't use. And we normally we don't see thrombi uh, complications as you describe in, in your chapter two. Um, do you have an explanation for that? Uh, it depends on how long you use the ECLS because if it's just short after uh, cardiac surgery. Um, most often the people are not put on the ECLS for a very long time and the longer you wait, the higher the risk for thrombi complications. Mm -hmm. And these patients were not only uh, post-operative patients, but also patients that had uh, inflammatory diseases of the, the lung mm -hmm. and they were put on ECMO for a longer time. So I think that can uh, explain why we see the heparin-free uh, heparin period and the heparin free period more often in this uh, chapter. Okay, um, then let, let's talk about the, the chapter in which you describe the parameters for outcome. So you, had a, you have a very good model and uh, but as always it's a plenty multitude of, of parameters 30 mm -hmm. or 40. Mm -hmm. In your opinion what do you think are the most important in, in your daily r routine to predict 
whether a patient will survive, will survive without complications or with complications. What is the most important? What would you say? Okay, so in our prediction model was uh, sort of explorative uh, research. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we used all the variables that we were able to get. Um, however, in the database that we used, it's the ELSO registry. It's a great database because we have information about all the patients all over the world that were put in HLS. But the main disadvantage of that database is that we do not have any information about uh, laboratory results. So we do not have information about hemoglobin or a platelet and also the platelet function. And most importantly, in my opinion, the anticoagulation use or the management of the anticoagulation. And I believe if we look at uh, the occurrence of bleeding complication, this is something viable that should um, be embedded in a prediction model, the use of anticoagulation itself or not. Okay. Then the last question from my side, it's, um, it's about the, the endothelialization, the, the biocompatible materials in the future. Yeah. Um, if you use uh, coded circuits, um, what do you do with the anticoagulation and, and what do you see in the future? What will be our, our perfect circuit? Okay, so in my opinion, the perfect circuit would uh, not activate the inflammation system or the coagulation system mm -hmm. at all. It's a utopia. I don't think we can get there. However, I think it's good to have a look at the surface um, relief. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the animal kingdom, there. Are, if you want aerodynamics, they often have relief and also in sports when you look at uh, ice skating oh, yeah. or swimming they have relief and little dots on their suits mm -hmm. but our tubes are not with mm, relief yeah. so i think this is very interesting to look at and i think the combination of clinical researchers and basic scientists should intertwine a little bit more um, because if you would uh, perform flow um, uh, mating up um, with uh, fluids through tubes, mm -hmm. we could uh, win some something there, I believe. And also with um, the bio passive coatings, mm -hmm. I think we should look into uh, more mimicking the endothelialization of our vessels itself. Um, and I've been to the European Research uh, Center of the. Um, um, uh, space agency mm -hmm. and they were already um, uh, trying to do some 3d printing with uh, stem cells mm -hmm. i mean i'm not sure if we end up using stem cells in in the circuit but it's i think it's a nice research to look into if there are some possibilities to use it in our clinics as well and if it's possible it's not only useful for ecls but for all uh, types of uh, cannulas or uh, IVs that we put into a patient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I fully agree. Thank you. <coughs> Professor Boeken. Then we continue the opposition by the Professor Vlasselaars. He is Professor of Intensive Care at Leuven University, Belgium. He also was a member of the Manuscript Assessment Committee. Professor Vlasselaars. Also from my side, many congratulations for you and the promoters for this excellent work. I have a few questions about the prediction models. You mention quite often in the manuscript that there are some things missing, variables missing. Mm -hmm. um, it was also mentioned by my colleague, but what do you think, what variable should be in the prediction model and how it could influence the, the validity of the prediction model? Okay. Thank you for your compliments and also for the nice questions, uh, your highly esteemed opponent. For the prediction model, as I mentioned before, I really believe that the management of anticoagulation should be used in the prediction model. I mean, if a patient doesn't have any anticoagulation at all, the risk of bleeding complications would of course be lower than if we use uh, heparin the whole period that the patient was put on ECLS. And also if maybe we could uh, use the um, uh, targets, so ACT or APTT, 
The problem is that each center has its own um, guideline. You know, you have the ECLS guidelines and uh, they say uh, infractured heparin is most often used. You can use APTT or um, uh, anti-XA uh, uh, as targets or as uh, values to control your um, dosage. But also argatroban and bivalirudin are used and you cannot really compare them with each other. So I think it's important. Ideally, we would use these in, uh, in the data set as well and collect all this information. And we can see if there are big changes or big differences between the group of argatroban, bivalirudin or heparin. And then we can use it in the prediction model and see yeah, which targets we should uh, use. Um, if you look at the data or the, the publications that were published, there were no big differences found between heparin and argatroban or heparin and bivalirudin. And also between bivalirudin and argatroban, there are no big studies that study the differences in uh, bleeding complications. But I think we need to know more about the anticoagulation management before we can improve our model because we don't really know what we're searching for yet. Okay. Furthermore, on the prediction models, you've chosen VV versus VA. Should it be worthwhile looking at more the um, indication, looking at respiratory ECMO versus cardiac ECMO? Because in my experience, it's more the cardiac patients that are bleeding mm -hmm. than, the, than the respiratory. And in quite a lot of centers, VA is still used as a respiratory ECLS support. Yeah, I think you could discuss about this because if you use veno-arterial ECLS, the cannulas are inserted in the arterial system. Um, and in my opinion, this could influence the occurrence of bleeding complications and especially cannula bleeding complications a little bit more than if you would separate the groups by the underlying mechanism. I believe the underlying mechanism is also very important, but I think the, um, the mechanical issues and the differences between venovenous and venoarterial are more important than the underlying mechanisms um, for the bleeding prediction, at least. Okay. The trauma patients, mm -hmm. you look at it as a, as a, as a group, but in my opinion, there is the use of ECLS as a kind of resuscitation for the trauma patient. And there is the use of ECLS that's more in the advanced stage of the trauma patient. And you looked at it as a whole, and then you looked at the, um, uh, the, the outcome. Do you think if you would look separately at those two groups, it would change is a different outcome? Um, can you explain what you mean with the advanced group? So let's say a, a trauma patient that after two days develops ARDS because of fat embolism or massive transfusion, but it's still called as a, a trauma patient in the ah, registry. Yeah. 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 I think if you would look a little bit more closely into the different types of trauma patients, as you would call it, I think in the resuscitation group, as we call it now, you would find more bleeding complications because those patients, they were put on ECLS in a very hectic environment. Um, and usually the patients that develop RDS after trauma are already on the intensive care. You already see it coming. You see that your uh, ventilation uh, is not working anymore. And you're already anticipating for uh, the use of ECLS. So I think in the second group, it's a more uh, controlled um, way of starting the ECLS. However, there are not big um, uh, studies published about this and there are often case reports or uh, case series. And um, we were right now uh, primarily interested in how often does uh, bleeding complications occur because be previously we thought you should not put trauma patients on ECLS because we already know trauma patients itself has a high risk of bleeding and we know that one third of the patients on ECLS develop bleeding and we don't, don't want people to die because of the bleeding. 
Um, so we were primarily interested, is, is it indeed too dangerous to use ECLS in trauma patients or not? But I believe there is, we should look into it more and more research must be following because I think these patients could benefit from ECLS just for, not as a treatment, but for stabilizing for further treatment. One final short question and a short answer. You mentioned that VV patients uh, have a higher incidence of intracranial bleeding. <clears throat> What's the cause, you think? Honestly, I find that very difficult to understand why that is. <laughs> That's my short answer. <laughs> Can I give you a small hint? Yeah. I think it has to do with the venous cannulation of the jugular vein and causing probably higher venous pressure with anticoagulation, and maybe that's the reason of bleeding. I'm not sure, but that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vlasselaars. Then the opposition will be coordinated by Professor uh, Gilles Sumino. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon in this university and university hospital. Professor Gilles Sumino. Thank you. Dear candidate, first of all, congratulations for uh, your great work and congratulations uh, also to your supervisor for the, also for the excellent thesis. I would like to, maybe you have already answered uh, to the, with the, your previous, uh, um, to, to previous questions, but would like to go back to uh, the, what is the, one of the main feature of your thesis, so the reduction in, in uh, bleeding complication during ECLS. Um, my first question is, do you uh, find, what is your opinion, and did you explore any difference between uh, venovenous and arterial venous complication? What is the difference, what is the cause, if you have you know, difference in, in, in the two first. Uh, in, uh, if you have, uh, in other words, the, what is the cause of this uh, reduction in, in bleeding in venovenous and arterial venous CLS? Okay. Thank you for your question and your compliments, your highly esteemed opponent. Um, first of all, to answer your question, what causes the difference between venovenous and venoarterial bleeding uh, complications, the rates? I believe, as I uh, quite mentioned before, that the cannulation type is um, very important um, to explain the differences. Um, in venoarterial, you administer the cannula also in the arterial system, and often the venoarterial patients um, were put on ECLS after surgery, so often they could have surgical uh, wounds as well. And if we uh, look at the trends of the bleeding complications, it's often the surgical side bleeding that were decreasing and the cannulation side. So I believe this is these are the most important complications. And in venoarterial ECLS, the patients have more risk to develop surgical side bleeding and the cannulation side bleeding. And you ask a second question, but I forgot it. Could you please <laughs> repeat it? What's about, uh, I want to know your opinion about what is, uh, for instance, the, the next question would be, uh, what is the, the, the weight of cannulation against, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the anticoagulation regimen in this uh, uh, reduction of, of bleeding complication? What is your opinion? Okay, so my opinion is that the cannulation previously was often uh, performed open, and now we use more often percutaneous cannulation and the risk of bleeding complications in percutaneous cannulation are less than the open cannulation. Um, and about the anticoagulation, I believe that after surgery, you should not immediately administer anticoagulation drugs to prevent further bleeding. They already had anticoagulation drugs during the operation, and afterwards, they still have often open wounds if you perform central cannulation and if you do have closed wounds, the wounds are still there and from the inside wounds still need to heal and if you would administer a lot of anticoagulation um, the risk of bleeding from those surgical sites are too high as well. So I believe you should start with a 
heparin-free period, or if you have a high risk for a clotting or emboli, or you see that your membrane of the ECLS is not functioning because of clotting, then you should start with uh, administration of anticoagulation. Do you think uh, may we uh, aim uh, uh, at a further reduction in, in bleeding and uh, how, in your opinion? I think we can working still... more uh, working on more on the side of improving coagulation or improving more improving uh, the the, the anticoagulation. Yeah, I think we should look into more the the anticoagulation mm -hmm. management. I believe we already win. A, one a lot with the percutaneous cannulation. We already know you should not put uh, anticoagulation directly after surgery, which we did previously. And uh, right now, I believe we should look into more individualized anticoagulations for the patients and uh, the management and the, the, the control of the dosage of these uh, anticoagulation drugs. As mentioned before, we do not know which drug is best, if we should use heparin, argatroban or bivalirudin, because there are no studies um, showing one is better than the other. But if we do use, use all three of those, we should know uh, how we should um, manage them, if we should uh, um, follow the ACT or APTT or uh, anti-XA, and in what kind of order, what kind of targets should we strive to. I think we should look a little bit more into that as well, because right now every center uses its own protocol and it's based on their own experience. Um, I think if we combine all our knowledge a little bit more together about, about how we manage the anticoagulation, um, we could find a, a more protocolized uh, anticoagulation management. Okay, let me congratulate uh, once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gelsomino. You leave some additional time for the others, I see. So, the next one is Dr. Van der Pol, General Surgeon Intensive Care Specialist uh, at this university and the University Hospital. Dr. Van der Pol. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, many congratulations to you and your, uh, your team for this uh, fantastic thesis, which I really enjoyed from the first until the last page, um, page 245. Um, and I think the, the most important conclusion of your scientific and personal uh, investigation is in the very last sentence of your uh, thesis uh, with the conclusion that general surgery is more interesting than, uh, <laughs> than thoracic surgery, which I can only fully agree on. Um, other thing I noticed on this page 245 is that you uh, mentioned your uh, birthday, but not your birth date. Um, and it would be impolite to ask for, uh, for a lady her uh, birth date or her age. Um, but maybe it has to do something with the fact that in Jaarsveld, where you were born, and I had to look it up at Wikipedia, there are only 275 people living there, um, which probably means that everyone has a separate uh, birthday and there is no need to mention the birth date there. Um, <laughs> But um, we are here to discuss the scientific part of your, uh, of your thesis, and I would like to share some thoughts uh, with you about chapter four. Um, and in chapter four, you uh, describe your prediction model on VV ECMO, um, making use of the very uh, rich uh, database of the, the ELSA registry, which, as you mentioned before, uh, uh, entails uh, patients from all around the world. Um, but that also means that it uh, uh, contains uh, patients from different systems, different uh, cultures. And when I look at the, the patient characteristics of, uh, of all the patients, which are uh, derived from the, the tables five, six, and seven, then I um, don't fully recognize the, the constitution of the patients in my own daily practice in the university hospital here in Maastricht at uh, the ICU and the patients that we put on VV ECMO. I see 10% um, patients uh, getting a surgical cannulation, 8% eight patients who are, uh, 8 of the patients who are on renal replacement uh, therapy before starting ECLS. Uh, 14 patients, 14 percent of the patients who had uh, cardiovascular surgery before starting venovenous uh, ECMO, and also quite some uh, number of patients after uh, cardiac arrest. Um, 
my first and really uh, short question uh, is more for, for explanation for myself so uh, you can uh, give a short answer and then we'll go to the to the real question is um, I saw in table five and table seven uh, yeah you know you're quite that I am quite interested in uh, cardiac arrest and ECMO I saw different numbers on patients uh, uh, with cardiac arrest in the in the database in table five there are uh, 1664 patients or 9.2 percent and in table seven there are only 705 patients or about four percent um w w where does that uh, difference come from so the underlying diseases table seven is uh, a table where um the um, uh, diagnosis were put in the registry and the other table, the table five, is um, if it was a, uh, a rest setting that uh, afterwards they put the ECLS. So in the data set, um, <coughs> you are able to fill in multiple diagnoses and usually they do only the primary diagnosis and sometimes they do a secondary, a few secondary diagnoses, but it's not mandatory. Yeah. And the, uh, Pre-ECLS uh, field of table five is a mandatory field, so that's why there are different outcomes uh, of the tables. Okay, thank you. Um, but my, my real question concerns about the the repeatability of this uh, this uh, prediction model, which is clearly developed uh, in a population that is very much different from the population that we are seeing here every day. Um, is this uh, which are mostly patients with a viral pneumonia, uh, some patients with CO2 removal, and only very limited number of patients with other indications for a venous ECMO. Um, what does that mean for the, the, the validity or the, the usability of this prediction model in, in our own system? Okay, so I believe that the um, um prediction model that I presented is not ready to be used in a clinical setting yet. I believe this, this was an um, uh, explorative uh, analysis. We had different um, studies that were explaining or finding different risk factors for bleeding complications. There was no cohesive uh, answers to finding risk uh, uh, variables at all. So that's the reason why we put everything, all the variables in our analysis. And um, right now, this could only help further researchers to see, okay, these, these uh, variables are useful and these variables are not so useful, and then build further on the, this information. If you would use it right now on the, in a clinical setting, the population, in this data set is too heterogeneous and also we are missing very important variables in this model. So I believe right now the model that I presented and uh, the, um, um, the outcomes in, in the tables that I presented are useful to build further on this. And you could use it in a research setting to predict a little bit, this might be a high risk patient, it might be a low risk patient, but you have to still um, discuss or, or analyze which uh, cutoff values you would use for low or high risk patients, um, because that's not embedded in this model yet. And um, we use this model usually, uh, mostly just to see which variables are useful in the future to improve the model yep. because there was only one other model uh, available and they had a risk factor which included the use of veno venous or veno arterial ECLS but that doesn't make sense in my opinion because yep. you already know what kind of ECLS you want to use. Yeah. You, you just made your point that uh, that it's uh, you don't think that, that you should make a distinguishment between uh, VA or, or between uh, diagnosis when patients are on, are on different uh, modalities VV versus VV but would it make sense to uh, make a distinguishment in uh, the, the diagnosis uh, in people who are on VV, so uh, that's, uh, let's say, uh, people who are on VV ECMO for uh, viral pneumonia should be um, uh, get a different prediction model than patients who are on VV uh, for another reason, or is, is, is it all the same? 
Okay, so ideally, if you would have a perfect prediction model, of course, it's better to have very homogeneous groups. But we do not have a model at all, except for the one that I presented for Vino Venus ECLS. And if you would want to make a prediction model, you need to have a, a big data set with patient that in, yeah, if you want to separate it with all pneumonia or viral pneumonia or whatever, yeah, the, the diagnosis must all be the same and then you can make the prediction model. But uh, as far as I know, we do not have the data for to make so many different kind of models. And I think sometimes in the, in the clinical setting, you do not always know what the underlying mechanisms is or there are Double, yeah. but, but th there are in, in your database some very big groups ARDS 40%, pneumonia 40%. Did you ever look at these very big uh, relevant subgroups? No, we did not separate oh. the groups to uh, to make the prediction model. Yeah. We and that, but that, uh, that you don't think that would, that that would make sense to do that, or no? So we use the diagnosis as a risk factor. Yeah. So you see in the, if you um, go to page uh, 69 uh, 96 sorry mm -hmm. you can see that the diagnosis of heart failure respiratory failure those were and pneumonia those were significant predictors yeah. and uh, ARDS was apparently not yeah. according to our analysis okay and then an, uh, another question I have if there's still some time I think yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, they're not done with me. Um, <laughs> you write on uh, page uh, 91 uh, that there were potential predictors identified based on biological and clinical possibility. Um, and then you mentioned specifically pre-lactate values and mean airway pressures mm -hmm. uh, were thought to be important factors in bleeding complications. Why of this entire very big list of uh, r potential risk factors you uh, uh, picked those two to treat, uh, to give this very special treatment in your statistic uh, handling? Um, I can explain to you why I mentioned only these two, because these two values were missing a lot in our database. The other values did not have, they had least missing, uh, less missing values. So what I tried to do is mention all, like all the variables that we put into were thought to be important, but also these ones, because if you look at the missing variable uh, values, they were more than 50%. And usually you dismiss those uh, variables because if you have more than 50% missing, the imputation is uh, a little bit more difficult to interpret. It. But um, in this case, we thought they are so important that in the use of this huge data set, we agree on using the models and impute these variables while knowing the missing values are quite high. But, but what does that mean? I, I'm, I fully trust your, uh, your statist statistician because I know him is a very competent uh, statistician. But what does it mean that uh, you have 70% uh, of the, your uh, cohort is uh, missing lactate, but mm. you give lactate still a very prominent position in your model? What does that mean for the external validity of the, of the model? So for the external validity, it doesn't yeah. really Or for the mean internal anything, validity or... Yeah. yeah, so for the internal validation of the model, it doesn't mean anything because with the internal validation, you just check if the model is suited and overfitted or not. And it wasn't overfitted, so you know the model will uh, predict in the same way in external cohorts. The only thing is that with imputation, we s calculated possible lactate values in the other patients and uh, the least patients you have and the higher missing values you have, the predicted lactate values are somewhat unreliable. But with the data set that we had, even with the 30% of lactate values that we did have with imputation, there's still a, an uncertainty, but it's less than if you would put the imputation in a, the same data set, but with only uh, 1,000 patients. So because we thought the lactate was important and we know, knew that we had a very large data set and still a lot of lactate values, we decided to impute those values. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm satisfied with the answers and hand the word back to the Prorector. Thank you, Dr. van der Poel. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Tenkate. He's uh, an internist, physical medicine, specialized in hemostasis and thrombosis. And uh, he was not a member of the assessment committee, but today he is, has kindly agreed to take the position of secretary of this promotion committee. Professor Tenkate. With pleasure. <clears throat> Dear candidate, congratulations also on my behalf. and. Uh, also for the supervisors, I had the pleasure of being involved already in a couple of previous discussions and the co-author on, on some of your uh, papers. Uh, much appreciated. I, I, I learned a lot and I also became increasingly confused, of course, about <laughs> the uh, causes and consequences of, of well, coagulopathy and bleeding and hemorrhage. Um, and um, um, yeah, originally I had a question on chapter 7. However, with, with the previous discussion um, in mind and hearing, well, your argumentation, I'm actually more curious <coughs> to pursue a little bit on the hemorrhagic complications, and that will not surprise you. But perhaps as a starting point, I can ask one of your paranymphen to read uh, Proposition 3. <coughs> <laughs> Prediction of bleeding complications during ECLS is difficult and further investigation, including anticoagulation and laboratory data, is needed to improve the prediction models. Thank you very much. And I will not ask you about the prediction models because that has been already thoroughly discussed, I think, by the previous opponents and by you. Mm -hmm. um, but you also mentioned in the, the prior discussion with Professor Jill Solmino, uh, you gave a few interesting arguments, I think, that, that, that lead me to uh, well, ask you about the methodology that we are using to handle anticoagulation, because you identified it as one of the key issues, I think, in the bleeding complications, the way we deal with anticoagulants. That's the type of anticoagulants, but maybe also the, the monitoring of the anticoagulants. Um, as a first question, do you think the type of anticoagulant matters? for bleeding, whether we use heparin or our gatoban or another thrombin inhibitor? Do you think, for instance, we would still need an RCT to, to see what's the best of these agents? Let me start with, first of all, thank you, your highly esteemed <laughs> opponent, for all the great uh, uh, compliments. And to answer your question, as of now, it seems that there is no big differences in the outcomes uh, if you compare heparin, argatroban, or bivalirudin. I'm not sure if a big RCT would make a great difference. I think we should focus on if you use argatroban or if you use bivalirudin, how should you use it? And how should you monitor it? Monitor it? Okay, and how should we do that? <laughs> okay, so I think if we would collect more data on um, the type of anticoagulation that was used and the targets that were strived to, um, I think we could have more insight of developing bleeding complications or not. I did not find any data of um, uh, big cohorts that were looking into this. I only found small data sets mm -hmm including maybe 30 patients and they looked at, okay, let's, let's check if, if ACT is easier than APTT or a combination. And um, there were no great outcomes or surprising outcomes. But maybe if we use bigger data sets, we would find it. Um, and I think we do have a lot of data sets that are, that are still collecting, such as the ELSO registry, and it would be in my opinion, ideally, if we could include these values in those data these sets. As well. mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's what you mentioned indeed. And do you also think, for instance, with the, well, the increasing uh, capacity or the, the better capacities of the tubing systems that become less thrombogenic, that we may be able to reduce the amount of anticoagulants that we would give and strive for? lower target values with ACT or whatever test we used? Yeah, I, I believe if we would impro improve these systems and um, 
diminishing the, the, the interaction of blood to the system, then we do not have the need to administer uh, the amounts of uh, anticoagulation that we now do. And, you know, the, the administration of the anticoagulation and, and the dosage management is still difficult, but if we somewhat somewhat find a way to to, to delete the whole interaction yeah, yeah. that we yeah. do not have. But to that's part of the utopia that yes, you mentioned yes. to delete, and it's, it still is. But I, I think, honestly, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, research to be done in, in this field, mm -hmm. but it's diff I think it's difficult to um, to have the basic scientists more interacted with the clinical scientists, I think we should build a bigger bridge and work together. Because if we would find a way to improve those systems on a basic level, then subsequently the the other problems that we run into might diminish as well. I, I fully agree. I'm happy to, to help you build that bridge uh, in the near future. A, a final small question and a short answer. <laughs> Uh, um, the current protocols for anticoagulation, are these sufficiently standardized? Or do you think we can still improve on how we organize I think, it? I think we could improve on it, but they are standardized within the ECLS centers itself. So every center has its own protocol. Okay. And uh, uh, it's because the, the ELSO guidelines, the worldwide guidelines say you can use different types of anticoagulation, and you can use different kind of uh, dosage control uh, uh, tests. And uh, the last sentence in the guideline is, uh, it's uh, advised to use the anticoagulation methods and drugs uh, that you are most experienced with. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's great. Room for improvement. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm happy with your answers and give the word back to the proactor. Thank you, Professor de Kaart. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Bidar. He is cardiothoracic surgeon at the University Hospital. Dr. Bidar. Thank you, highly esteemed prorector, highly esteemed candidate, dear Anna. Congratulations. There you are after years of hard work at the Department of Cardiac Surgery. Uh, and I would like to congratulate you and your uh, team with this fantastic uh, result. And I have to politely disagree with my highly esteemed neighbor <laughs> about your conclusion to proceed in general surgery, but be that as it may. Uh, I would like to challenge you in a thought experiment in which uh, you're uh, driving a car and along the way your car stops and you manage to reach a garage and they diagnose your car with low in petrol. And in a couple of hours, um, the mechanic comes back and says, well, we put a new engine inside and you have to pay for it. Of course, I'm talking about the brave chapter two. Um, could you elaborate on that? How would you feel about that? Uh, thank you for your compliments, <laughs> your esteemed opponent. I find it a bit difficult to follow your a story and to connect it with my chapter two. So could you please elaborate? So could the chapter two, uh, as you know, is you looked at uh, using extracorporeal uh, life support and mm. in bleeding patients. Mm -hmm. uh, could you um, uh, conclude your, resu your results in one sentence? Yeah, I could. And my conclusion is that bleeding patients that are in need for circulatory or respiratory support when the conventional treatment is not enough should not be considered contraindicated. Mm -hmm. So you would, um, if a patient is bleeding, as, um, as you know, you have to treat first what kills first. Mm -hmm. And you have, of course, also contributed into uh, implementation of ECMO in several settings, I think, and you know the amount of resources that it requires to be, and the time, and the, mm -hmm. so in that moment when you have to decide, would you go to the operating room to stop the bleeding, or would you stay and implement an ECMO, what would you choose? 
I would always choose f- first source control if it's possible. So if you have a bleeding patient and you are able to go to the operation room, please do immediately so. Because as you said before, treat cur- first what kills first. <laughs> but if you do not have the time or your treatment yet, then you could use ECLS to try to maintain and stabilize the patient while waiting on the treatment resources that you need. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you for this answer. So I would like to proceed to the second question. Um, so imagine now we are uh, at the <laughs> bedside of the patient and uh, we have to, uh, we are deciding on uh, inserting using an ECMO. Um, what were the, what would be a couple of things that the surgeon would fear the most in that situation um, concerning patient characteristics? You mentioned already oral anticoagulation, uh, whether the patient has had thrombolysis, for example. Mm -hmm. What would be another patient characteristic that would be important for us? It is important to know if the problem that the patient is facing is reversible or not. Mm -hmm. Because... But more practical, just imagine Uh, we are are looking for, we are afraid of um, just opening the groin because that's where we are. I think the BMI would be an important aspect. Yeah. So what would be your thoughts on that? You may very briefly uh, finalize your answer if you wish. You may also remain silent. I think the BMI is indeed something to look at when you want to insert the cannulas, but you should you don't have to put it in the groin, you can also put a a cannula in the neck area. So there are multiple ways to perform cannulation, even if the patient is quite big. Thank you very much. The the time for the defense of your thesis has passed away. No, passed away, has passed. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) Uh, The the committee will uh, withdraw for analysis of your answers and the quality of your thesis. And I ask you and your company to remain in this hall until we return with our verdict. Thank you. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because faith decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Get the
outside. Seven miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If there's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the south side. Mm -hmm. Seven miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. Mm -hmm. No place like home.
te leggen. Niet al die va- data ja. kloppen. Ja. Want je schat eigenlijk gewoon wat ja. de waarde gaat zijn. Ja. En dat zal waarschijnlijk bij een groot deel niet kloppen. Nee, maar goed, dat is wel Oh ja, oh, daar moet je wel ik weer met je collectie Ik schrok jou ook sinds jij zo vaak bent. Ja, nou, ik had al gerealiseerd toen ik nu op de zit. Oh ja, ik, ja, ik was heel blij dat jij daar zit, zitten, want ik vond het echt goed. Nee, ik dacht het wel daar. <laughs> Mind you that we are in the Netherlands, I do one minute in Dutch. Uh, geachte Promoventa, de commissie heeft zich beraden op de kwaliteit van uw proefschrift en over de wijze waarop u dat heeft verdedigd en op grond van haar positief oordeel over beide en gelet op de vroeger door uw afgeleide examens, heeft zij besloten u het gevraagde doctoraat toe te kennen. Professor LaRusso is entitled to confer upon you this uh, academic distinction. The floor is to your promoter. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present uh, and also online, I hereby confer upon you, Anna Withers, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. Anna, again, really a lot of congratulations. But I was thinking with uh, Professor Swall, and based on your international work, I, and also the work done by Professor Swall, I, uh, we decided that I will uh, ask Professor Swall to give the laudatio also based on the amount of work she did with you. Okay. Professor Swall. Dear, dear Dr. Villas, dear Anna, I would like to congratulate you for this excellent scientific achievement. It's a really a big pleasure for me being here, even virtually, with you, your family, friends and colleagues, celebrating this major achievement in your scientific career. As you know, I like working with you very much. And I have been thinking about your contribution and it was have been important and meaningful. The ECMO support is increasing. Your research about bleeding complications has been acknowledged in several publications, which already have been cited many times. You easily handled a huge database of more than 50,000 patients. And I always appreciated your enthusiasm you put in your scientific tax tests and of objectives. Looking at your passion, it made me proud of supervising your PhD pathway. Your important scientific results are clear proof of your dedication to the clinical and research setting. And please um, allow me to tell one more message. You have been supervised by the giant of cardiac surgery and ECMO, Professor LaRusso, who is also my supervisor for a long time. He showed me how important and critical the scientific network is, and uh, in particular of other disciplines and specialities, 
whatever your background are of area of interest and practice is. We all are scientists and investigators, no matter what our background is. And uh, we all have the same aspirations and objectives using our knowledge to treat better with improved outcome of our patients. Working together with you, once more, I appreciate the importance of beauty of working together from different and many times equal perspectives, exchanging ideas, visions, data analysis, and interpretations. It was a real pleasure having a four year period of research with you in Professor LaRusso team. I hope and I am sure you will keep on working this way with a strong dedication and motivation in the clinical surgical field as you did in other fields, challenging yourself in sports, long distance swimming and running. And I also followed your traveling adventures with interest, and to be honest, also being a bit jealous, wishing I could also travel uh, with you for such uh, exotic countries. I would say friendship among peers, which is not as simple and easy to find nowadays. Our collaboration will give us more, a lot of more, always with the help of all the colleagues and friends we have now in the ECMO community. So finally, let me congratulate obviously with you, your girlfriend and your parents for this well-deserved recognition of the University of Maastricht. And I'm sure that you will keep on going this way with your strengths with this on our collaboration and friendship. Congratulations, Anna. Thank you. Then Dr. Willis, I have the honor to congratulate you also with your doctor's title on behalf of the university and you are an alumnus of this university, so it's a great pleasure for us to have you here finalizing your academic education and starting your further career. Thank, Thank you. you for choosing us as the university where you wanted to have your thesis defended. I also thank uh, the, the guests from other universities, Professor Buchen and Professor Vlasselaars, for the honor to be present here and to, by your presence, uh, making the ceremony more solemn than it already was. You had, of course, also a task as, as members of the assessment committee, and then we are always happy that they are also able to attend the ceremony itself. The other people who are present, I do not have to thank because they are here because of their position at this university and this their job and they are paid for that. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> still good to have you here. Um, yeah, and then I finalize by wishing you a very pleasant further education as a general surgeon. I understand you have chosen that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, wishing you a good career in general surgery and one of the specialties, no doubt, in that field. <laughs> what will it be? Or is that too early to say? Not sure yet, no. Not yet. Okay, and a, social, and a successful social life, I wish you also, because that's very important as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then, uh, having said this, I come to the, fin to, to the uh, actually to the end of this academic session. But before that, I say a few words in Dutch, uh, sort of uh, instructie, hoe verder. Uh, so now I switch to Dutch uh, about the photos and the leaving the wall, because we. Oh, wacht, dan moet ik het ook in het Nederlands doen. <laughs> uh, we vinden het altijd mooi als wij een hele groep op de foto hebben, en daarvoor is het nodig dat professor Swol nog aanwezig is. Die wordt dadelijk uitgeveegd, die fade away digitally, but. Zolang ze er nog is, nemen wij de gelegenheid om haar op de foto mee te nemen, als de fotograaf er ook ergens is. Waar is die? Ja, ook goed zo. En intussen kunt u dan, het publiek kan dan alvast de zaal verlaten. Gaat u vast naar de receptieruimte, geef je receptie. Dank ja. daarvoor. Um, en dan kunt u al een biertje pakken. En dan maken wij die foto, dan gaan wij nog in processie naar de hal. Maken we nog een statieportret op de, de, de trappen, daar mogen ook moeders, geliefden en wie er nog bij zijn. 
dan moeten ze een beetje nog niet naar de, naar de borrel lopen, dan moeten ze daarbij blijven. En dit gezegd zijnde sluit ik deze academische zitting.